previously on Pat the NES Punk. Ah, uh, I'm to a collection here. Uh, don't really need them or want them. I'm not sure why I have them. Why do I have these? I don't know why I have this. I don't know why I have this. Why do I have this? Why do I have them? I don't know why I have this. Why do I have this? <laughs> I need help. Waste of time. What am I doing? They're just video games. I'm holding like a thousand bucks worth right in my hands. That could be going towards something useful, something memorable. Like a vacation. I can go anywhere I want. I can go to Scotland, Italy, Tahiti. I wonder if there's NES games in Tahiti. Most of these games cost a ton of money, but they're terrible. Tag and Dragon? Awful. Action 52? Abysmal. Castle of Deceit? Castle of Crap. Color a Dinosaur? Is, is that even a game? Who cares if they're rare? What's the point if I never want to play them? And look at this stupid cart. It's going for 500 bucks on eBay. Why? It's based upon a cartoon that hasn't had a good episode since the 60s. And it wasn't even funny back then. Oh, look. A prehistoric record player powered by a pterodactyl. That's hysterical. Is there any reason to own these games? Maybe I should play through one of these games to see if any are decent before I get rid of them. All right, Dinosaur Peak, you're up. We'll have a gay old time. That's from the show? Taito could be called the king of the late NES era. From 92 to 94, they released a run of quality action platformers like Panic Restaurant, Jetsons, Power Blade 2, and Little Samson. These titles largely went unnoticed and unplayed though, due to the much lower production run of NES carts during this period since publishers were focusing more and more on the Super Nintendo. In 1994, one of the last NES games released was Flintstones, Surprise at Dinosaur Peak, a sequel to the rescue of Dino and Hoppy. Rumor and speculation amongst NES collectors is that Surprise at Dinosaur Peak was a blockbuster exclusive for rental, and was not sold commercially in the US. While there is no evidence to conclusively support this, there are indications that it was distributed through video rental stores, blockbuster included. But at the end of the day, only OCD collectors like myself care about this meaningless crap. What about the actual game? Flintstones. Meet the Flintstones. It's an action platformer by title that's very rare and I had to sing the theme song right now to get it out of the way. Based on the classic Hanna-Barbera cartoon, the players take control of Fred and Barney, those lovable cavemen who have to rescue their children Pebbles, and that violent little brat Bam Bam who somehow got out on their own and are now trapped behind a flow of lava. Great parenting job, guys. Where's Bedrock's Child Protective Services? It's not too surprising, though. These two aren't the best role models to begin with. In order to save their kids, these Neanderthals decide to travel all the way around the island to get to the other side of the mountain. Why couldn't they just lay down some prehistoric bridge? If this was the show, you'd have like a string of armadillos tied together and the problem would be solved. Or here's a strange idea, how about a boat? They could even call Amagon to come help out. And what good is Gazoo? He can teleport all around but he can't show up on the other side of the screen there to help him out? What an asshole! In Dinosaur Peak, the player uses both Barney and Fred at the same time, swapping between them on the fly by hitting the select button. They both have strengths and weaknesses, which must be utilized on each level to succeed. And in fact, there are many spots in the game where you have to use one character or the other in order to proceed. Well, that just awkwardly rhymed. Fred is equipped with a club for attacks, which can be charged up to increase the damage done, although most enemies in the game can be dispatched by one or two blows. Fred also has the ability to jump up and grab onto cliff or platform ledges, from which he can then pull himself up. He can also lower himself off platforms or ledges as well. Fred's going all Prince of Persia on us! Barney has a long-range slingshot attack, but it's weaker than Fred's club. Barney doesn't have the brontosaurus power to climb ledges, but he can grab pipes and climb up them or shimmy across them, and even fire his slingshot while hanging from them. The controls are good, but there's a slight delay when activating your weapons and jumping. 
If you're used to other title games like Panic Restaurant, you'll notice it's very similar, probably because it's using the same engine. The gameplay is enjoyable, as it's a blast encountering and taking out prehistoric birds, dinosaurs, evil watermelons, and monkeys! Stop hitting me with your nuts! You know, it's always bothered me that the Flintstones show had dinosaurs living at the same time that humans did. But it's nice to see the oh-so-plausible theory of creationism in action. The levels change it up quite a bit, from the standard jumping and bopping of enemies, to sections where you ride on log rafts, swim underwater, deal with conveyor belts, and more. There's even a surfing level and a shooter stage. I'm a sucker for games that attempt multiple genres, and here they're, they're all pretty good. There's a good amount of power-ups and items to collect in each level, including a secondary weapon, either a bowling ball or axe, items to increase your health and power meter, and stars you can collect to spell yabba dabba doo Trademark! If you spell out the iconic phrase, you'll receive an extra life. The game looks pretty good. Graphics are lively, detailed, and everything from the stage's background to the colorful prehistoric enemies to the Flintstones themselves utilize the game's cartoon roots to great effect. The animation is solid, which for an animated cartoon license is essential. And speaking of the cartoon's roots, if you're a Flintstones fan at all, you'll appreciate seeing supporting characters from the show like Fred's boss Mr. Slate or the Martian Gazoo. That useless asshole. Hello, cave babes. I wonder if Fred and Barney ever do any wife swapping. Oh, come on, you've all thought about it. Tidal just about always does well with their music, and it's no exception here with Dinosaur Peak, as it's well done and catchy, if not good enough to be totally memorable once the game ends. The famous theme song on the title screen is probably the highlight, and just about all the other music is lively with just the right amount of quirkiness. The sound effects are fine for what they are. They aren't outstanding, but serviceable. Although the sound when Fred's club is fully charged up is a little obnoxious, and the jump sound is unnecessary and a little juvenile. It's the nice touches the game delivers that make it a little more than a standard platformer. When you press down, Fred and Barney's heads tuck inside their clothes. It doesn't do much, but it's something you'd see in the cartoon, which is alright. There's a couple of cool little bonus sports levels where Fred and Barney play caveman hockey and basketball for bonus items. It's not particularly well done or even necessary, but that's why it's cool. It's just a goofy little diversion from the rest of the game. Plus, you get to see Barney twerk it! Shake it! Don't break it, Barney! The challenge of this game is pretty high, especially the first time playing through. Every level requires you to face new obstacles and traps and adapt to them. There are later levels that not only require you to use either Barney or Fred to continue on, but will require a combination use of both of them to solve a few problems, even requiring switching while in mid-air after a jump. This is some inventive platforming going on here, and it will take some getting used to. Unfortunately, some of the challenge is a bit unfair. When you're hit, the amount of time it takes to recover is really too long for a platformer like this that requires timing and fast reflexes. There are moments when just getting hit once will do you in, so you'll have to play perfectly in some spots. This game also suffers from what I like to call Mega Man-itis, or encountering parts of a level that no amount of skill can account for, since what you're seeing is entirely new and you have just about no time to plan or adjust for it. Like this part where you have to escape from a rolling boulder, or this section riding a stone minecart, where you will die at least once, guaranteed, just trying to learn what lies ahead and how you have to play it. It's a relief then that the game gives you unlimited continues to account for this sort of trial and error gameplay. This is probably the game's biggest flaw, but there aren't many. Stage bosses are rather simple once you have their patterns down, and if you know what you're doing, the game is fairly short. Other than that though, there isn't a huge amount to complain about. Taito knew what they were doing in the late NES era, when just about all other publishers had abandoned the system, they stayed on, using their deep NES knowledge and experience to put out some solid games. Let's slay that nasty dino. This is my serious face. Yay! Fred and Barney rescued Pebbles and Bam Bam! What? Fred feels foolish because they were toasting marshmallows on the lava? Oh, that's a hoot! It's that sort of cornball comedy, which is why no one gives two pterodactyl shits about the Flintstones anymore. And there you go. The mysterious and elusive Flintstones. Surprise at Dinosaur Peak a game that few have played and even less have owned. It's a fine action platformer that isn't perfect by any stretch, but there's enough here that was done well, from the inventive level design, to the fun action, to the great use of the Flintstones license. It's yabba dab of fun! <laughs> See, not all Rare NES games are terrible. Sure, the Panesian Portal games are awful. 
and I'd rather eat a T-Rex uterus than ever play stadium events. But let Flintstone surprise Dinosaur Peak? It's got some good stuff going for it. It's worth playing. But is it worth owning? No! In 2009, you can buy the game for about 100 bucks, maybe less. In 2013, though, it's going to cost you at least half a grand. And that's not some sort of natural price progression that's been going on. I wish I could say it was. There's been rampant speculation among collectors and resellers alike that have driven the price up. There's some people that have owned several copies of it. I've personally met and spoken to an asshole who said he's owned at least two dozen copies, gladly spiking the price up the past couple years. So you know what? Screw it. If they're going to play those sort of bullshit games, don't buy it. If you want to play it, there are other means. And a means which I never ever recommend. That's right, Rob. Emulate the hell out of it. If sellers are going to play unethical games, fight fire with fire. No one will get hurt, except those sellers who bought all those extra carts, and now no one's going to buy them for the cost that they paid for them. <laughs> Taito! Taito, the programmers, the developers, they won't care about some game from 94 that 35 people played. That's just it. No one cares about this stuff. 25-year-old 8-bit games? Well... What's the point? It's meaningless. You guys watching, do you even care about the, the games? Really? When you think about it? Do, do I even care about the games? Has this just been a waste of time? Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. Thank you.